Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to have you here. I'm Linda Rossner, Chair of Hollywood Sinti Chapter, and we are excited to present to you uh, a, a, a topic that we've been wanting to cover again for quite some time, uh, the audio aspects of ATSC 3.0. Uh, just a couple of uh, house cleaning notes, and then I'll let you guys get started. Uh, for anyone that wants to become a member or renew a member, I'm gonna send everybody on the Simpty Hollywood mailing list, uh, a flyer and a promotion because it's $20 off whether you're renewing or whether you are joining and you will have access to over 100 sessions from Simpty Nationals Conference this last year. Uh, I also want to make you aware of the slide that's in front of you right now about another uh, undertaking, under, understanding ATSC 3.0, Next Generation TV and the future of broadcasting. Uh, there is a cost, but you get 25% off if you use the code that's, uh, that's there. And uh, we just hope that you all will uh, look at it and participate. So uh, without any further ado, again, thank you all for joining us. We're thrilled and I bring you to our moderator, Lon Neumann. Hello, everybody. Uh, I think that somebody is still sharing a screen. We still see that last slide. Great, here we go. So I'm Lon Neumann of the Immersive Audio Alliance. Today, we have a panel of the industry's foremost experts on our topic. The next generation audio features of the new TV standard, ATSC 3.0, some of which I'll show you here. So let me just remind you of something else. This is a Zoom webinar, so there are no open mics for the audience. But if, if you have questions for our panelists, please present them by clicking on the Q&A button uh, that you should find at the bottom of the frame. We'll be uh, working in questions between segments uh, as we go. We're honored to be opening with Madeline Nolan, the president of the ATSC. She'll be giving us the view from the top of the food chain. Take it away, Madeline. Thanks, Lon. Well, what I think I'll try and do is share the screen, but before I get started, I just want to make sure my audio is okay, because this is an audio panel, so the audio better be okay, right? You're doing fine. All right. So what I'd like to do is sort of uh, take everybody through a top down. Um, I think that probably many of the folks in this audience already understand the basics of ATSC 3.0 or Next Gen TV. And so we won't dwell too much on that, but we will talk a little bit about the deployment as it's going now, and also talk a little bit about how we hope that SIMPTE and SIMPTE members can participate in the development of this uh, system and the ecosystem. So we'll do a quick introduction to NextGen TV. Uh, we'll do our deployment update. I wanna talk a little bit about ATSC3 as a platform and then talk a little bit more about what we need from the creative community. So I think everybody probably knows what ATSC is. I'm the president of ATSC, and ATSC is a standards development organization, just like SIMPTE, um, although not quite like SIMPTE because you're also a professional organization. But in any case, we develop uh, voluntary standards and recommended practices for terrestrial digital broadcasting. Um, the idea is to facilitate interoperability with other media 
There's about 150 member organizations in ATSC right now that pretty much span the gamut of the ecosystem from the consumer electronics manufacturers to the broadcasters, to the networks, to the silicon providers and the equipment vendors and the technology vendors and everybody in between. And I would also add that SIMPTI is one of the founding organizations of ATSC among the others that are listed there. So I wanna put ATSC 1.0 in perspective. And the reason why I wanna do this is because sometimes people ask, why ATSC 3.0? Why do we have to have a non-backward compatible system? What are these TV guys thinking anyway? So let's think a little bit about ATSC 1.0. Well, when ATSC 1.0 was developed, we had Windows 3.1 on DOS. We had dial-up modems that did 19.2 uh, kilobits per second of throughput. We had analog 2G cell phones, which were probably weighing about as much as a brick. And we had VCR on tape. And we had ATSC 1.0. And um, I often like to see if anybody can uh, identify the young man that is in the, uh, uh, in, in the image here. Um, this was quite a few years ago, but he's still very recognizable. So if you know who he is, put him in the chat box. And uh, the, the prize is, I don't know what, the prize is a beer next time we get to get together. Anyway. So the point of this slide is that ATSC 1.0 is actually over 20 years old now. And while ATSC 1.0 has been tremendously successful, the media environment around us has changed dramatically. And TV needs to have a new system that's gonna allow them to number one, start to do the, start to do the 4K, HDR, wide color gamut and more. Um, uh oh, we've got somebody in the chat box here. Let's see, we've got some identifications. Yes, ah, <laughs> Jim DeColepis was there. Okay, well done, Jim. You are correct. That is Glenn Reitmeyer. Um, so I owe you a beer, Jim. Don't forget. The um, and and the idea was that ATSC 3.0 is going to be a new modern system, which is not only going to allow the broadcasters to become part of the modern ecosystem, but it's also going to allow them to evolve quickly over time, just as the modern ecosystem of uh, internet and, and other platforms, <laughs> he wants a Sam Adams, perfect, my favorite, um, as, as the other uh, platforms evolve quickly as well in the OTT world, for example. So what were the goals of ATSC 3.0? We definitely wanted to add value to the broadcasting service platform, which includes enabling new business models, reaching more, more viewers on more devices, address changing consumer behavior. Um, you know, we're talking about smartphones and tablets and geez, cars, you know, who knows what. And it's also not just about television anymore, although we're gonna focus on television because that is remains and probably will be for a long time, the cornerstone of the broadcasters uh, business goals and use cases of ATSC 3.0, also called Next Gen TV. So ATSC 3 was developed by really the best of the best. I couldn't be more impressed with the engineers from around the world who gathered together to develop the ATSC 3 platform. There were close to 400 individuals that were emailing like crazy over the course of 10 years. And at one point, uh, Dr. Chernock, who was the TG3 chair for a long time, had done some research to find out who emailed people and who, you know, what was sort of the highest traffic level and I'm sorry to say that I was up there. So my apologies uh, for spamming everybody's email boxes, but uh, it was an extremely active group uh, across all the organizations within ATSC. And it was also an international group. So what we wound up with was truly the best of the best, the state of the art in uh, digital terrestrial broadcasting for media services and more. So what do we get? Well, we got a non-backward compatible system. And when you're gonna do a non-backward compatible system, it had better be good because it's gonna be a voluntary transition and it's not gonna be easy. So there better be really great incentives to do this. So what have we got? Well, we got a much better physical layer. It's flexible, it's configurable, and today it is the world's most efficient one-to-many digital transmission, uh, digital terrestrial transmission system. We have transport, which is IP based, and this is the first digital terrestrial transmission system, which is based on the IP protocol. 
And we have on top of that the MMTP and the root dash um, transport protocols. Of course, video had to be improved. Um, consumer research shows that what people really like about TV is TV, which is number one video and number two audio pretty much across the board. So ultra high def, HDR, wide color gamut, high frame rate, and scalable video coding for a number of use cases. And right now, HEVC is specified, although the system is extensible to include VVC and other codecs. For audio, of course, there's immersive audio personalization, and the two systems that are specified are Dolby AC4 and MPEG-H audio. The interactive application system is also quite revolutionary. It's completely based on HTML5, excuse me, on W3C technologies, HTML5, CSS, JavaScript. But of course, the W3C doesn't write um, a code or, or specifications for everything that TVs need, because the things that TVs need are not always the same as what a web browser needs. So we have also authored some WebSocket APIs for what we would consider to be the TV specific features of the interactive system. For example, you could ask your TV to change its channel, or you could ask the TV whether captions are turned on or off, or you could ask the TV whether or not there are parental uh, controls in place. All of those things would fall under the WebSocket APIs, which are unique to television. We also have much improved um, features for accessibility for the hearing and visually impaired community. And that includes more language tracks, uh, the ability to have closed American Sign Language or any sign language for that matter, uh, multiple captions, tracks, and more. The emergency messaging system is much improved. And we also, of course, have the ability to deliver any data because this is an IP-based delivery system. So why not deliver software updates, map updates, who knows what? So we have the ability to deliver data to the internet of things, if you will, whether that be cars or smart agriculture, digital signage, you know, smart city infrastructure and other types of uh, systems, which are increasingly ravenous for data. And the system is also convergence ready. So the idea is that this DTT system can interoperate with other data delivery networks, including over the top, LTE, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, you name it. If it's an IP data delivery system, then the idea is that ATSC3 can coexist with those systems and have sort of intermingled capabilities with those systems. So this is a, my, one of my favorite slides. Um, this is one of the reasons why ATSC3 has come into being. So what you see here is the physical layer and the data capacity that it offers. So the blue line is what is, is called the Shannon limit. And it is the theoretical maximum amount of data that you can push through an over the air signal relative to the strength of the signal. And so the strength of the signal is, is um, listed here in the X axis where the, the signal is stronger and stronger as you go to the left and weaker and weaker as you get to the right. And the Y axis is how much data you're able to push through. So as you can see, you're making a trade-off between how strong your signal is and how much data you can push. Well, the green dot is today's APSC 1.0 standard. And of course, there's two huge differences between the green dot and the red dots, which is ATSC 3. The first difference you'll notice is that if you're sitting at 15, S 15 decibels SNR, you're already getting about a 30% boost between ATSC 1.0 and 3.0 in terms of data capacity. But of course, the most obvious thing is that ATSC 1.0 is operating in a single data point, whereas ATSC 3.0 can operate at any number of data points across the curve. And broadcasters can do more than one of those at the same time. So they could have a very strong lower capacity signal together with a less strong but high capacity signal. And you could envision that they might have, for example, a mobile service, which is operating down in the lower area, and a fixed service, which is operating in the upper area, where the fixed service might have higher spatial resolution and the mobile service has lower spatial resolution, which is intended for smaller screens. So it's a pretty exciting change. In addition to the physical layer being able to deliver 30% more data um, in the same signal strength, we are also moving from MPEG-2 video codecs to MPEG-2 to MPEG H.265 video codec, which gives us yet another huge boost 
And with the new audio systems, we can also do a tremendous amount more than we used to. We can in fact deliver multiple languages in full 5.1 surround sound with the same throughput uh, capacity need as we are with ATSC 1.0 delivering a simple full mix. So it's pretty exciting what we're able to do with the new system. There are some innovative technologies in ATSC 3. I'm not gonna get into these uh, excruciating details of the physical layer and the transport layer, et cetera, but uh, I mentioned some of these things and what's really exciting to me is the number of innovative inventions that are a part of ATSC 3 that make it so special. I wanna talk a little bit about the deployment because people might wonder, well, ATSC 3, it's, it's only so good until it gets actually out in the field. So where are we? What's going on with the deployment here in the US? In the US, broadcasters have announced that 62 markets will launch ATSC 3.0. And among those 62 are the top 40. So when all 62 are broadcasting in ATSC 3.0, we will be reaching about 75% of US households with ATSC 3.0 services. The map you see here is from ATSC.org, and you can see from the uh, screenshot here that if you go to Spotlight ATSC 3.0 and you scroll down, you'll find the deployment tab and here you'll find the map with all the cities that are currently lit up. The uh, gray ones are the ones that haven't made any announcement yet. So we don't know what's gonna happen with those markets just yet. The dark blue ones are the ones that have announced but haven't actually made the first step yet, which is to um, file for their FCC licenses. The light blue ones are the ones that are filed for FCC licenses, but haven't yet actually lit up. And the orange ones are the ones that are currently on the air with ATSC 3.0. So you can follow the progress at ATSC.org. The other question that always comes up with respect to how is the deployment going is what's going on with the device market? Well, we have some research that came out of the Consumer Technology Association not too long ago, um, around the CES timeframe that showed, okay, in 2020, um, which was the first year that products were available on the market, and it was you know, in the middle of the COVID pandemic as we still are today, unfortunately, but we still managed to have 24 or 26, I can't remember the exact number, um, models that were available out on the marketplace and about 300,000 of those shipped. And what we see here on the graph is CTA's estimate of how many models, excuse me, how many units of next gen TV enabled television sets are gonna ship over the course of the next few years. And you'll see that we're gonna be reaching roughly 12 million around 2024. And when you add these up cumulatively, we're expecting that there would be roughly 24 million television sets in the United States um, in homes that can render next gen TV. The CTA also said that if this technology matriculates into the lower end models, um, I think the correct uh, euphemism is the less complex models of television sets, if it matriculates into those models sooner rather than later, these numbers will go higher. Um, I'm actually quite pleased with how quickly the system is moving into those models. Generally speaking, when you start with a new, um, a new technology, it starts in the very, very, very high end and it takes a long time to matriculate down. But in 2020, we had models that were, yeah, the very, very high end, 85 inch, 8K, OLED, QLED, everything under the sun. But we also had models that were under $1,000 that were pretty reasonable, um, nice mid-tier sets. Um, so we'll see what happens. What else is out there besides television sets? There are set-top boxes, dongles are coming in, converter boxes are coming. Um, the two noted here are available now, the Zapper box, which is shown here in the upper right, um, and the HD Home Run Connect 4K, which is shown in the lower right. Both of these boxes are available at retail now, and they will connect to an existing television set. Not You don't have to have a 3.0 capable TV in order to use these two boxes. Um, we also have the Zinwell box, which is white labeled, and I think they're looking for partnership. And one of the most exciting things is the silicon vendors. So MediaTek has come out with its chipset, which bodes well for the marketplace of um, next-gen television sets coming out of China, for example. And low-cost converter boxes are being explored. As you all remember, when we switched from ATS from analog to digital, there were a bunch of converter boxes came out and they were pretty cheap. So eventually we're gonna get there. 
but I'm very pleased with the way things are going. If we have 24 million television sets that, that are next gen TV capable uh, deployed in homes in a few years or even more, not to mention the set top boxes and what might come, that's pretty good. But you know, it's a three legged stool. People say, oh, it's a chicken and egg, or broadcasters going first, or the receiver makers going first. Well, yeah, you know, we need to figure all that out. And the broadcasters put their stake in the ground, and the receiver makers are, are, are definitely um, getting into the game. So, but what's happening on the content side? What are we going to see on these new TVs in these markets that are launching? So, here's what we understand about the television feature roadmap. We understand that the features that broadcasters are going to be working with in 2020 and 2021 are consistent loudness and voice boost. And I know we're going to hear a lot more about that from the rest of our uh, panel. 1080p and HDR video and 4K and immersive audio on select programming, what you might call stunting, like, for example, the big game might come out in that way. When you look forward to the future, we might look at more programming that has consistent loudness, voice boost, and additional networks with um, coming online like cable, more content in 4K and HDR and immersive audio, and we're going to start to see some rich content, which can include advanced emergency information, interactivity, multiple audio tracks, and more. And then when we look beyond television, we're talking about distance education, automotive, radio, cable, advanced emergency messaging, and more. And even further ahead, we might be talking about mobile and more data cast, etc. And those of you who keep track of all the acronyms, uh, you probably have this enormous dictionary in your own head. What does MDG stand for? Well, this is Maddie's best guess. So you can take this for what it's worth. Um, this is what my thought is based on what I've heard. And why are we doing 1080p instead of 4K? Well, it comes down to bang for the bit. While broadcasters have to simulcast ATSC 3.0 and ATSC 1.0, and there are all these crazy channel sharing agreements going on, we got to pick the right thing to put out. And so the idea is that with HDR, we can get a really great boost in video quality without too many bits to spend right off the bat. We're certainly going to do some 4K. That would be my expectation. And 4K will become stronger and stronger. But until we can start turning off ATSC 1.0, 4K is probably going to be a little bit limited. When you think about the audio features, the audio features can be a wonderful boost without spending this kind of bandwidth. A little bit on the international side, we have South Korea, which launched commercial services in 2017. They're now 75%. The Brazil SBTVD forum is evaluating ATSC3, among other proposals for their next gen system. And India's telecom, uh, India's telecom SDO is studying ATSC3 and other technologies for broadcast traffic offload and direct to mobile. Um, and there are a number of other countries that have uh, reached out to ATSC to learn more about the ATSC3 system. And we have a planning team that helps coordinate those engagements. The last thing, a couple last things is that ATSC is a platform. So unlike previous standards, it can evolve. So if you think about web browsers that can be updated frequently, ATSC3 has to also continually develop so that broadcasting can keep up with market demands. And ATSC is the group that's maintaining and developing the 3.0 platform. And happily, our members are also users, so hopefully they're going to get it right. So there's some technology behind this evolvability. I'm not going to get into the, too much detail about this, but understanding that ATSC 1.0 is 20 years old and it hasn't changed that much over time. And part of that is because it's really hard to change it without abandoning viewers. So one of the key requirements of ATSC 3.0 is that we have to be able to evolve it in a backward compatible way. There are a lot of opportunities for innovation with the standard as it is today. So if you recall the slide a couple of slides ago, Maddie's best guess, we're looking at 1080p, we're hoping to get 7.1 plus 4, we're hoping to get some HDR and this and that. So we can actually, we got a lot of headroom in the standard without changing the standard one bit. But for even more innovation, we can change the standard and evolvability is built into it in many ways. The idea is that we can continually upgrade ATSC 3.0 without orphaning legacy devices. And that's a wonderful new um, uh, development for 3.0. So as I mentioned, there's lots of room for innovation. This is kind of getting into the nitty gritty details. I'm sure the slides will be available for people.
But you know, thinking about XML versus binary, thinking about discrete physical layer pipes, and the key um, features of the bootstrap, allowing receivers to kind of skip stuff they don't understand and lock on to the signals that they do understand, all these are important parts of the APSC 3.0 system. And as SIMTI members, you all know this better than anybody, standards have to stay at the vanguard of what's happening in the marketplace. So we need to stay ahead of the ecosystem. So we're continually evaluating new technologies that can drive our products forward. It's a platform and ATSC members are stewarding its development forward. We have a planning team that studies the broadcast, the future broadcast ecosystem technologies, such as the newest codecs and cool things like haptics. We're working on core network technologies and there's CMAP, as you probably know, and lots more coming along the pike. So ATSC is pretty busy. Not only are we working to support the ATSC3 standard as it exists today, but we're also thinking about what are we going to need tomorrow and let, how can we stay ahead of that. And what I want to leave with is a thought, which I think that the rest of the panel is really going to talk about. So, okay, engineers are good at some things, but when it comes to proof of concept and how you're going to get there, you know, here's an engineer's version of what is a really cool graphic. Uh, we put hello world on a screen. So in other words, we write this great standard and we have all these cool tools and we're trying to do a proof of concept to show people how cool it is. And this is what we come up with. So what we really need is the content creators cool graphic. We need you guys to come up with this stuff. And whether that's in the world of audio or video or both. But the point is, is that if you're thinking about chicken and egg between the broadcasters and the television sets, don't think about it like that. Think about it like the three-legged stool. You got the, mar you got the televisions in the marketplace. You got the broadcasters that have the distribution platform. We need the content creators to put something really cool out on that distribution platform, so the people who are getting those new TVs in those markets with that service can look at those, look at that service, and listen to that service and say, "Wow, that is cool." So that's my message for the Simply Hollywood Group. Think about these tools. How can we bring this content to life? How can we really make this platform sing? And with that, I will turn it back to our host. Thanks, Madeline. I, I think Greg might have a couple questions for you. Let's yeah, see. actually, a couple of real good ones out there uh, from Michael Heiss. Uh, any update as to when we will have our first next gen TV outlet here in Los Angeles? I have an in HD Los Home Run Quattro. Hmm? Bear with me. So I will uh, put in the chat box. Um, hold on a second. Oh, I'm chat. Uh, I'm going to put a website in the chat box. It's called watchnextgentvnow.com. Great. And Thank you for that. If you go to watchnextgentv.com on the page, the main page, and you scroll down, you'll see a map. And the map has cities that are color coded. And the cool thing about that map compared with the map that I just showed you is that that map is designed by the broadcasters. And what they're doing is they're saying, this is when we're going to launch. So my city, Boston, is on there for basically the first half of 2021. So I'm waiting for the announcement. Um, and I'd have to go to that website to check and see where LA is. But I'm going to guess it's either, it's definitely in 2021. And I don't know whether it's the first or second half. Sweet. Okay. Thank you. And then one other question from Daniel Schultz. Have any DVR manufacturers such as TiVo announced plans to incorporate ATSC3 tuners into their products? I have not heard that yet. Um, as I say, one of the things that's the most exciting to me is the silicon vendors getting in the game. So for example, I've heard, and don't quote me, but I've heard, for example, that Roku um, uses a lot of MediaTek silicon. So where MediaTek now has ATSC3 um, chips and reference designs, it kind of bodes well for some of these things, but I have not heard any specific announcements yet. So we will we'll have to wait and see on that one. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, Excellent. One more, one more. Uh, oh, that's not a question, Never mind. Uh, it's just a comment. So thank you, Michael, for that comment. Great. So we'll carry on here now. And um, I want to pull up something here. And 
go ahead. So <clears throat> it was mentioned uh, in passing, but uh, ATSC 3.0 actually in, permits, incorporates actually two different audio codecs, the uh, AC4 codec from Dolby and the MPEG-H codec from Fraunhofer. And uh, my belief, my current belief is the decision about which codec to employ has been regionalized. And the MPEG-H codec from the Fraunhofer Institute is or or will be uh, deployed in uh, the advanced television systems of South Korea. Uh, Brazil was mentioned. Uh, uh, Europe, I believe, in, uh, in, in, in places, and I think China. But in any case, there, is, there are the two codecs. Our next panelist, Stefan Meltzer, is the Chief Business Development Officer at the Fraunhofer Institute, the home of MPEG-H where it's now after 3 a.m. In, in the morning. So let me uh, pass the baton to Stefan. Please welcome Stefan Meltzer. Thank you, Long. Um, and good evening to everybody. Um, please bear with me if I'm a little bit tired because it's early in the morning, as, as Long mentioned. And um, MPEG-H is, is used already in Korea. And um, so, let me tell you a little bit more about it. Let me just start the presentation. So here. Um, so it's used in Korea since 2017. It's it's on air 24-7. Uh, currently, most of the people are using it, um, the broadcast using it for stereo and 5.1, but also we see first immersive and then object-based audio uh, transmissions. And I would like to use the opportunity here and walk you a little bit about so the um, so the features of MPEG-H or next generation audio because Dolby AC4 has similar features, uh, but Tim will go into more details afterwards. And also I would like to, to show you that it's not so difficult to include the next generation audio in, in production and uh, show you an example how we did this in a big live event in, in, in Europe. So let's go through the features. So there are three main things we are looking for in uh, in MPEG-H audio. So we have interactivity and accessibility, we have immersive sound, and we have universal delivery. So the important thing here is that we have a very ex uh, efficient audio codec below, but now we want to improve the user experience by giving them more, the user more options in terms of the personalization of the audio presentation. So you can adapt to your preference or use situation by, for example, adjusting the dialogue. And so you get rid of the problem that you stop watching a series you are interested in because one of the characters is always mumbling and you are not understanding it. Um, so you stop you watching it. By adjusting the dialogue, by raising the dialogue, you can improve the situation. Or you can select different um, audio versions. Um, for example, in a sports match, you can select that you want to have a home commentator instead of a, the um, away commentator and so on. So these are possibilities where, as Madeline said, creatives have now the say and use the tools we are providing to them. Immersive sound is something which a lot of people like. And um, with soundbars, we are not running into the same problem as we had with 5.1 when we started transmission in 5.1 because <clears throat> soundbars can be easily installed and you don't have to distribute a lot of speakers in your room. Um, that's one important uh, element, which uh, helped us also in Korea to convince broadcasters that uh, investing into immersive sound is something useful uh, because they didn't believe that people would put um, 5.1 plus four height speakers in their living room. So soundbars is a very important element here. And another one, which is universal delivery. So we have advanced DRC and loudness features built into the system, which then allows the uh, content provider to use the same bitstream on different devices and reach the optimal um, result for, for all the devices. So whether it's headphones, where you can use binaural technologies in addition for immersive sound, or whether it's a, a tablet, <clears throat> where you use built-in speakers, whether it's a soundbar and AVR, or whether are these speakers in your system, in your TV system. So we also have different content formats. So we have the traditional channel-based audio, 
We have object-based audio, which allows us all the interactivity, and we have scene-based audio in MPEG-H. Um, it's also known as higher order ambisonics, and these elements can also be mixed. So you can have channel-based audio uh, for, for example, the ambience, and you can use object-based audio for the dialogue, which allows then the interactivity of the dialogue. Um, this all is controlled by a lot of metadata, and I know that a lot of people in the audio world are very scared about metadata and how to transport them, but I will explain to you how we do it in this advanced system in the future, which then leads me to the production. So we looked at the complete chain from the authoring to the, um, to the reproduction. So author, authoring all the metadata authoring, putting together scenes, um, which <clears throat> describe what the user can do, monitor it, broadcast it, and then of course we have the TVs and the um, layout systems. So for the authoring, we provide <clears throat> an authoring suite, which allows you to, to build all the scenes or uh, edit all the channels, edit all the objects, and put together how they interact with each other and what the user can do, because Quite important when we uh, offer the interactivity, this all should be under the control of the broadcaster or the content creator. Uh, so you define the range, what the um, consumer can do at the end, how much he can raise or lower the dialogue if you want to move objects, audio objects to the side or up and down, how far it can go. So this is all defined by the content creator in the beginning. And this is done with, for example, the, the authoring suite in the post-production. But the real difficult part is when you get to the live production workflow. And here we have developed with partner companies, Zunger and Linear Acoustic, special uh, devices, which we call the authoring and monitoring units. Um, you see both of them and their screen here. And I will go a little bit in more detail how you build up <clears throat> an audio scene um, when you use the Zunger device. So here you see the screen. And up on the top, you see how the group are defined. So you have an international, uh, uh, French, and an English group here. So the international, that's from the uh, French Open, which where we did a live trial. The international would be, in this sense, the uh, stadium atmosphere of the court. Then you have a French uh, commentator and an English commentator. So you see that. You have the type, the uh, international, the chord sound is the channel-based audio. The uh, commentators are objects. And <clears throat> you define here the final elements of, of the um, overall transmission. Then you have the group interactivity definition, where you um, say whether you have the interactive gain available uh, for, the <clears throat> for the interactive user in, uh, interaction. Um, you have the position you can turn on and off. So for the court, there is no positioning possible because you do not want to move the court. But for the commentator, you can move the commentator from left to right and uh, up and down. So this defines what you can do with the different elements. And um, then you can define what we call uh, presets. So the presets is what uh, the user can select at the end without doing a detailed <clears throat> interactivity. And we have a, a default preset. You have a dialogue plus preset where you raise the commentator and you have a stadium preset where you only have the stadium and no commentator if you want to listen only or you want to have the feeling like you are at the, at the venue. So this is then presented to the consumer and he can select what he wants to do. And if he wants to um, do more detailed changes, then he can go into an advanced menu and uh, can do that. So how do we transport all this, the metadata? Uh, <clears throat> there are two possibilities, of course. You have the newer ones where you have an internet connection. It's much easier than to transmit the metadata together with the audio. But in the older SDI-based workflows, uh, we are using the 16th, 16th track as um, a metadata channel, what we call it the control track. So we mod together with the audio in sync, and it's also quite robust. 
So um, you can do this <clears throat> without any problem. And we have tested this in, in a number of um, experiments and, and also a number of trials. So where is on air? So let me start with a music service. So um, Sony C6 Reality Audio Service is based on, on MPEG-H. It's now available at a number of uh, service providers and it provides you inter, uh, immersive music to your mobile phone by streaming. It's also a complete playback system. You can also stream it to AVRs and to, to soundbars. So going on to the different trials, which hit in 2019, 2020, unfortunately, with the pandemic, we are a little bit um, hampered to do more trials. Um, as you can see, Korea is on air since 2017. We are working with NHK in Japan on their next generation broadcasting system. Uh, we are working with uh, TV Global. We did um, the Rio Carnival in 2019 and Rock in Rio, which is the biggest rock festival in South America uh, on live transmission where we did uh, MPEG-H audio within the ISDB system deployed in, um, in Brazil. But we also did uh, streaming in parallel and did the transmission over 5G network at the same time. Um, I mentioned the French Open which we did. And um, also we did with the European Broadcast Union the Eurovision Song Contest in 2018 and 2019. And I want to go into a little bit more detail on the 2019 Eurovision Song Contest. So this was held in Tel Aviv. Uh, the Eurovision Song Contest is the biggest live production uh, besides maybe the World and European Soccer Championship. Um, in, in Europe. So <clears throat> all the EBU members are participating and you have more than 30 different languages um, in this song contest because all the countries are sending um, artists to the song contest. So every country one artist. And so this is <clears throat> a big event and the winning nation will have to then do the next year's song contest. So 2020, uh, would have been the turn for Netherlands, but unfortunately it was canceled because in 2019, the Netherlands artist won the song contest. So it's a, it's a live event. Um, we have more than hundred microphone feeds. Uh, we placed additional microphones in the uh, arena to get the ambience capturing. And uh, we did a 5.1 plus four height mix together with four additional objects for five languages. And we worked with a number of partners. You can see here, Solid State Logic, a TEM for the encoding, Jünger, Linear Acoustic, and, and Sennheiser for the soundbar. And you can see on the picture the team um, consisting of our, my colleagues and, and, the, and partner engineers. So <clears throat> what we did with the microphone setup, we had, uh, added an additional uh, Hamasaki square under the ceiling to get the, the ambience. And we had uh, two channel ambience microphones also under the ceiling. And with this and the other microphones getting we got from the uh, normal production, we were able to uh, pull off um, immersive, Im <clears throat> immersive production without a lot of additional overhead. So here you see that one of our sound engineers were able to do all the live production during that event. So we created a 5.1 immersive mix by pen and delay of the Moni ambience microphone signals and the upmix of the focals and effects from 3.1, uh, 3.0 plus two height front ear and the music um, upmixer. Uh, we also added in then the five additional objects from the host, the English commentary, French, Spanish, and Italian was selected here. And with a setup of a loudspeakers, you see the channel like loudspeakers, here's the typical ones, uh, we could <clears throat> do the live monitoring. Going into a little bit more detail, you see here the picture of the SSL console. And on the right side, um, the screen shows you the control window of the uh, linear acoustic authoring and monitoring unit. Uh, you can see the different elements, the different objects, and you can see how they are switched together and how they um, behave. So at the end, this was an encoded. We did uh, parallel encoding in the HD service. 
for DVB transport and DVB transport stream. So HEVC at 10 megabits. We had an AAC low complexity 5.1 and in addition ZMPEG H with uh, 5.1 plus 4 height and five objects. And this was done on a constant bitrate of 12 megabits per second. And in parallel, we did a streaming server as a dash service, um, also with HEVC at 5 megabits and the same audio bitrate. And this was then transmitted over to um, Tel Aviv, where we had a demonstration room, but also Geneva and Madrid for really in live. And so you could <clears throat> experience at the EBU headquarter in Geneva live Z5.1 plus four height mix on over a soundbar with all the possibility of interactivity and the um, <clears throat> broadcasters um, which were available or which were attending the demonstration in Geneva and Madrid were very much pleased about the, the outcome. So that's a short summary of what we are doing. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you, Stefan. Greg, do you have uh, pressing questions for us? We actually don't at this time. It must be a very complete presentation. Thank you. Good work, Stefan. OK, thank you. Thank you. So rolling right along now, um, the AC4, AC4 codec from Dolby is, is being implemented in ATSC 3.0 for North America and elsewhere. And for more on that, I recommend this, amongst other things. Uh, and not the least of which would be what Tim's going to tell us right now. So I'm really grateful that we have Tim Carroll from Dolby with us today. Tim works in the office of the Chief Technology Officer as the Senior Director of Sound Technology within the Advanced Media Systems Group. So please welcome Tim. Tim. Thanks, Lon. Let's see if I can make the presentation happen here. There we go. Seem to be working. I think it is on my side. It's working well, Tim. Okay, good. So I, I, you might be disappointed. I, I have only, or or thankful. Uh, it's definitely not as late here, but I've been in this little shed in my backyard for the last 12 hours, uh, just waiting to speak with Lon and everybody. Uh, I have a, a, a short number of slides. Um, when we talk about ATSC3, we can get a little bit uh, a little bit repetitive because the ATSC did a good thing. If you can believe this, the ATSC1 spec is is actually um, and I'm almost embarrassed to say this, uh, 26 years old. Uh, and ATSC3 was able to build upon that. So in the original spec, we actually had things like M&E plus D. We could transmit music and effects in separate dialogues. Now, the, you know, the AC3 codec was not as efficient as uh, AC4 and MPEG-H, uh, but you could do some pretty neat tricks but the way we handled it in the standard back then, we got trapped by a should shall, right? You should have two decoders, but you shall not have to have two. So of course nobody had two. And that meant that it was complete main for everything. Uh, but the idea came from the film stages, of course, I'm preaching to the choir here. Uh, music and effects and dialogue uh, are, uh, are separate. Um, and so ATSC3 uh, got this right and got it into the, uh, the list of things that were necessary for the specification very early on. At the same time that ATSC3 was being developed, uh, there was Dolby Atmos in theaters. And of course, like Dolby Technologies, they, they tend to start in the professional side or the cinema side and progress to the consumer side. And so Atmos was making its way to the consumer side. I remember uh, vividly, actually, it's strange. What does geeky people remember? Uh, so in, in addition, of course, to the birth of my children, I remember the first time at home, once I worked out all the HDCP and HDMI issues, 
uh, being able to actually get Dolby Atmos at home. That was a, a pretty neat thing. And so as this is going on, ATSC 3, this, the specifications being drawn up, and the goals that uh, the proponents had to uh, meet uh, to be included in the standard were, uh, you know, it included things like m and &E plus D, so that'll uh, allow us to do personalization and other things. Uh, of course, immersive audio, of course, efficiency. Uh, and as Stefan said, you know, uh, MPEG-H and AC4 are uh, very similar in, in lots of these uh, in lots of these ways. Um, so here's, uh, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about uh, the times that, you know, Lon and I have visited uh, friends in the LA Post community. Um, uh, Mr. Sandweiss, if you've joined us, uh, you weigh heavily on our minds as we think about how do we make this better than the last time? Yes, more features, absolutely. But, you know, there were a lot of features in ATSC1 also uh, that didn't get exercised because what's really hard, I mean, beyond the complexity of developing a codec, uh, it took teams of brilliant people, you know, uh, certainly uh, Fraunhofer's team, uh, Dolby's team, a lot of time, a lot of people, a lot smarter than me. But it's tricky getting, feeding that codec. How do you feed it with the right things? Uh, and once it hits the codec, when it comes out at the consumer side, how do you make sure that people can actually hear it? I mean, we're reaching the point, some of us, that if we get caught one more time on a ladder sawing holes in the ceiling of our new house, uh, it's gonna start to become life-threatening. So how do we make this work in a realistic way? I think of my, uh, my parents who have retired to Florida. The thought of having to tell them that for immersive audio, I've gotta come down and saw holes. I feel like I'm gonna get grounded again. Uh, so, how do we consider this as we talk about all these advanced features? So the pro side, uh, Stefan did a, a tremendous job of describing uh, tools that are uh, fairly common for uh, immersive and personalized content creation. So new mixing and monitoring tools. Um, it's fairly straightforward to put a monitoring environment in these days. Uh, it's being done for the creation of Dolby Atmos content that's being delivered uh, other ways, so of course it's going to work fine for ATSC3. But how do we get the resulting signal through traditional infrastructure? Yes, I mean we can look at SDI. In theory, it can pass 16 channels of audio. In practice, it's trickier than that, as we all know. Hey, this should work. Hey, it doesn't. Well, now what do we do? I think we all remember uh, everybody that's uh, here today, tonight. I think we remember the challenges of 5.1. Uh, in North America, uh, it's tough to find uh, metadata anywhere. So it's possible, it's just not easy. Uh, at the consumer side, so ATSC3, yep, can deliver consistent loudness right out of the box. That's great. It's built into the codec. Uh, again, personalization, of course. Uh, Voice Plus, which is the consumer facing name that uh, the CTA uh, is promoting dialogue enhancement. I th thought dialogue enhancement was pretty descriptive, but I give them credit. Voice Plus, when I described that to my parents, they're like, oh, does that make the voice louder? I said, okay, I, successful, it works. Um, the, I think the greatest thing, uh, and again, Stefan mentioned this earlier, sound bars. At first, I mean, I'm an audio guy. I'm like, soundbar, are you kidding? What, what is this gonna sound like? I have to admit, I've been stopped in my tracks. I am completely capable of admitting when I'm wrong, I was dead wrong. Soundbars can do some remarkable things. Probably the best thing is that it makes it, I won't say impossible, but it makes it a lot more difficult to, number one, not have a center channel, which I know 
really hurt us uh, with the uh, early days of 5.1. It really has affected how content has been created since then. Soundbar, center channel is there. If the soundbar is near the TV, the center channel is roughly in the right place. Left front, right front, come along for the ride. Surrounds can be discrete. Overheads can be virtualized. It's really quite effective. And even what's built into TVs, virtualizers are technology, is based on technology that I swore the first time I heard it, I said, you guys are tricking me. There's speakers in this drop-down ceiling and you're, it's, they're discretes. Um, and it wasn't, it was virtualized. It's amazing what can be done today. I saw Madeline in the, the chat box talking about uh, virtual audio over uh, headphones, same thing. It's remarkable what we can do uh, today compared to what was such a struggle uh, a long time ago. Something that's helped are these uh, fielded methods where, you know, we're ATSC3 is not backwards compatible but there's a lot of equipment out there in the field and the thought of starting from scratch and having to watch this ramp up uh, would have really slowed things down. So uh, there are some things working in the favor of uh, immersive audio. Uh, one of them is, um, it's a, a, a thing we have called MS-12. It's a multi-system decoder. Uh, it's pretty much a one-stop shop for the audio parts of devices that uh, reproduce uh, audio. It, it's found in uh, uh, most televisions, certainly smart TVs. Uh, so it's got, you can see from the picture, it's got decoding. It handles the, uh, the mixing, you know, inserting the bleeps and bloops. Um, speaker post-processing is something that can be added. And that stage that says encoding, so the output could be PCM audio. Works if it's two channels, HDMI. Works if it's 5.1 channels, again, HDMI. Uh, but what if you're connected to a device that uh, can't handle more than that? Well, you could actually send an encoded bitstream out. You could uh, DD plus encode that signal and send it out. It, it makes a whole uh, ton of products that are already out there compatible. There's another type of encoding and it's called uh, MAT 2.0. Uh, and this sort of breaks the bounds of HDMI, which uh, is traditionally limited to eight channels of audio. So with uh, MAT 2.0, we can send 31 objects or really channels uh, uh, plus LFE plus metadata over HDMI. And it's a way to uh, iron out the path between uh, source and sync devices, and it allows eARC, right? That's the return channel to allow somebody to set up an AVR with a television set. This has been challenging in the past, right? You get a television set, there's an HDMI output, you plug it into your AVR. You know, what if there is um, ATSC3 being received on that television? How do you get that signal back out to your existing AVR, uh, eARC does it, and the later versions of eARC uh, uh, will allow for MAP 2.0 to be carried. So encouragingly, and you'd expect this, right, 100% of Dolby Atmos TVs, soundbars and AVRs have MAP 2.0 capability. Uh, it's not really a, a sexy thing to advertise. How do you tell somebody, hey, this feature, MAP 2.0, it just works, and that's that's the key. Uh, source devices like Xbox, Apple TV, uh, the amazing Roku 4K Ultra 2020, uh, those devices uh, also uh, have MAT 2.0. And importantly, this really smooths the path for ATSC3 audio compatibility. So it's not exactly backwards compatible, you know, an AC3 or a, a, an EAC3 decoder is not going to decode AC4, but because of MS12, we can turn that into something that legacy products can understand, and it can vary between PCM and encoded audio. So uh, basically, I, I think that 
the ATSC deserves a lot of credit for shining the light on uh, something better for consumers. You can absolutely get this off air, increasing market by market. I'm these days in New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia, anxiously awaiting for the uh, the signal to uh, light up. But I do have a lot of other choices if I want to hear immersive audio, you know, from uh, Dolby Atmos Music through headphones uh, to you know listening in the shed out here. It's lonely, but it it sounds great. Um, and uh, with that, I believe that is my nice an uncharacteristically short presentation. And uh, I'll uh, hand it back to Lon. Well, thank you, Tim. Uh, and I can tell from looking that we have no pending questions at the moment. So we can pick up some some time here if we roll right along. Am I, am I mistaken, Greg? Is there any, do you, are you holding anything? No, Tim, another fantastic presentation. No questions, answered them all. Great, great, great. So, then consultant Roger Charlesworth is the executive director of the Digital Television Audio Group. And without further ado, please welcome Roger. Take it away, Roger. Mm, Roger, come in, Roger. Oh, it looks like we've lost Roger. I'm not seeing him on the, the masthead, so to speak. I wonder what's happened there. Oh, Lon, Roger uh, texted me. He he said uh, he's just lost his internet. Oh, he came to the end of the internet after all. Well. Lon, I wonder if um, I could ask a question. Um, sure. I, I've been... Uh, completely impressed and intrigued by the immersive audio experience through headphones. And I'm curious if, um, our, if Stefan and, and Tim can talk a little bit about why that works so well. I mean, it's amazing. You could hang 22 speakers from your ceiling or you could put on headphones and, and it just, it's, <laughs> it's quite incredible how good that sounds. It, it really is. And I'll just jump in here myself to say that there is more than one binaural rendering system in circulation these days. But the new Sony 360 reality system is just really pretty stunning. And I guess it's partly because they they characterize the response of listeners ears. Initially, they were doing it by measurement in the in the ear canal with uh, tiny measurement microphones, and they would measure the res the response of individual listeners to great effect. But that's obviously not going to work so much with the, the, your average consumer. I see we have Roger back, so that's good. But uh, but in later versions, uh, recently now, uh, they permit just taking a, a picture with your cell phone or with a camera to shoot the outer ear, the pinny, and and the, uh, the the canal. And from just taking a picture of it, they characterize the listener's hearing to the extent that they get really stunning results with uh, with headphones and which is not like falling off a log. You know, you can say, well, we always listen with just two ears and we get this perception. But normally with headphones, you don't get that. So it's it does take some clever processing to make it work, which essentially boils down to modeling the the response, uh, the individual response that's shaped by by the listeners ears and also the, to, to a degree the uh, related head related transfer function the hrtf but anyway i'm taking up roger's time at this point roger we're like ready for you so take i'm it sorry away. i lost my internet somehow everyone you know got to be netflix time i guess everyone was on the uh... you, you came to the end of the internet yeah there you go <laughs> i guess so you get the time of day when suddenly everyone's watching a movie. Um, so, you know, I, I think we've had some great background on everything that's happening with uh, ATSC and and with the the two audio systems. And what I guess I really want to do is sort of put this uh, a little bit more into context um, and. I, I think that we're in a, let me just, I have a couple of slides here. Let me just uh, 
get these going. Um, let's see. I just want to put this put this into context a little bit because there's been so much going on, uh, and we're in this incredible uh, you know time of change. Um, but the the important thing to remember is the next generation audio system that was sort of born out of ATSC3 is also has a life of its own. So when we're talking about developing content for ATSC3, we're not talking about some oddball content that's just for ATSC3, it's for, for everybody. Um, and, you know, ATSC3 played this incredible role. I mean, and, and Madeline talked eloquently about that, but in sort of developing these next generation features, uh, you know, this great collaboration of industry thought leaders, uh, sort of looking ahead at the kind of experiences people would be looking for, the, the uptake in immersive that virtualization would provide. And it really kind of, this whole thing really spurred the development efforts for, you know, for both entities on these systems for Fraunhofer and for Dolby. And uh, even, you know, competitively uh, trying to keep up with each other. Uh, so at this point, and I think, you know, Stefan really stressed this and the same things going on at Dolby is these systems, these audio systems uh, that were developed in ATSC are not just for ATSC3. They really have an impact far beyond uh, ATSC. And that's why they are important to to the Hollywood community uh, because they really are uh, between them, they're being adopted around the world. And, uh, you know, both of them, both systems were test, tested in France at the, um, you know, French Open Roland Garros um, and uh, uh, standards for metadata interchange and whatnot are being worked on. But already, uh, I mean, these systems have gotten out there uh, and here in the US, almost every new TV set that ships for, and that is shipped for quite a while comes with AC4 in it. Uh, so it's really already in place and beyond ATSC, other people are starting to make use of it. Um, and, you know, for all the reasons that we've talked about, the sort of bandwidth uh, and quality you know, better quality with smaller bandwidth, able to handle very small bandwidths, uh, and, uh, you know, these advanced features for immersivity, personalization, accessibility. Um, and the point is that, that these systems are really, you know, they're going to be the future of content distribution, and supporting these kind of features is something that everybody who's making premium content is, is going to want to support. Um, and we're really in this evolving content universe. Um, you know, on one hand, and I'll talk about this for a second, we have sort of the ex these expanding access to premium experiences. Um, and, you know, we all know this has been going on for a while, but the center of gravity of premium entertainment has really moved from the cinema to the home. And particularly under sort of COVID conditions, that's been really given even more impetus. But we can go to, uh, you know, Best Buy and for a few thousand dollars, you get amazing OLED, 4K, HDR, TV and and for a not much more, get a fantastic Atmos soundbar or get a TV with Atmos as most premium TVs are with Atmos capabilities built into it. So, uh, you know, these experiences suddenly um, are, uh, are, you know, are much more accessible and there's content to go with it. Uh, you know, not just movies and uh, premium episodic, but first run movies. So um, this isn't the province anymore of somebody just having a million, million dollar home theater. It's for a few thousand dollars. I can pay 
20 bucks and rent a first run movie and have, you know, an amazing sound bar, amazing TV set. Um, and these kind of premium experiences are also, you know, as, as everybody else has talked about, are available over a range of devices. So I can watch a, a movie in HDR on my, my new iPad and hear a virtualized Atmos in headphones. So these kind of a premium experiences are sort of being democratized in that they're not a tiny percentage of people able to, to hear immersive audio or see HDR pictures. It's, it's, a, it's millions and millions of people. Um, so, um, you know, and, and this is coming, these premium experiences are becoming available in a sort of, in a world where there's more and more content. And now we sort of have just beginning to see user generated content become more and more ubiquitous and millions of hours of content on YouTube. And now uh, Amazon or Google can allow me to start a live TV channel, my own personal channel, if that's what I want to do. So for creators of content that actually costs something to produce and hires actors and, and is being charged for, or, you know, otherwise monetized with commercials or whatever, uh, those, those people need to really continue to distinguish that content and will be looking for opportunities to make that content better and higher quality to cut through. And, and that's what we've already seen with HDR, with 4K, with Atmos. And really then we'll see it uh, even more so, um, you know, as these sort of person, personalization features come in and accessibility features going forward. And they really, uh, you know, I think, I think that the industry surveys sort of show those are going to be huge drivers that sports fans start to want to hear the commentary they want to hear or have the fan experience, have the game skinned for them, uh, home versus visitor. Um, and, you know, content is more international. We have a more diverse population. So uh, a range of languages uh, becomes you know, much more important. Um, so the good news is this sort of this advanced content, uh, we're going to kind of continue to converge on the production side and the post-production side. We're making this content for all these devices and we're making it for larger uh, use of it. Um, but as we kind of create uh, premium content, uh, cloud technology, AI, uh, IP infrastructure, all of these are kind of help uh, in the creation of that content. And I think will help uh, lead to efficiencies um, that will continue to lower cost and put more quality on the screen. Uh, and that line that we've seen blurring between well, what's a movie and what's a premium episodic, something like Mandalorian, is just you know a great example of something. There's you know premium premium content. Um, it's also leveraging technology to control production costs. Um, but I, I think we'll see when we talk about you know the creatives using these tools that are in the next generation. Uh, audio system, I think we'll, uh, we'll see these, you know, these practices uh, become widespread and uh, the distribution of this content type of content will be... Well, Roger may have come to the end of the... Sorry? Uh, will be, uh, you know... We can hear you. It's like my, uh, lawn may have uh, temporarily uh, frozen up. Oh, okay. Sorry. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm just wrapping. I'm just wrapping up. I'm just, you know, saying. I think that these, you know, that that this isn't something that is. This is something the kind of content that we're going to that takes advantage of this ne next generation audio features 
are, uh, you know, is the kind of content we'll be making for multiple outlets. So that's it for me. Well, thank you, Roger. Uh, looks like uh, we might have some uh, internet issues. I don't know uh, how many of you were affected by the great spectrum outage of last week. <laughs> Seemed like everyone was down from uh, Santa Barbara through San Diego. Uh, but I want to thank you, uh, Roger, and the rest of the panelists. Uh, uh, do you want to all turn your cameras on real quick? All right, Tim, Nad, Stefan, Roger. Thank you so much. Uh, Linda, I was just going to ask if you would like to come on and say some, some parting thoughts. Well, I want to thank everybody. That you, you guys were wonderful. And Stefan, again, what is it, 3, 4 a.m. in uh, Germany right now? It's now 4, 15. 4, 15. You're, you're our hero. You rock. Uh, Lon, you were fantastic. I thank you. Uh, Madeline, Roger, uh, uh, Tim. Uh, Tim, just, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'd love to see that shed of yours. I think it's wonderful. Uh, Greg, you're always wonderful with the, uh, with, with taking in the questions and Chris Alvarez, our, our technical guru. Uh, thank you so much for your time to all of you who have attended to all the panelists. I thank you all so much for joining us and we will see you next month with another meeting. Have a great evening all. Thanks, Linda. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you.